Hey guys, okay, so we are going to continue our read aloud of Holes by Lewis Satchar. We read chapters one through four this past time, so now we're going to read five through eight, okay? I had some questions that you needed to answer before we moved on, and most of you did that for me, so I was really happy about that. Um, so let's go over those questions really fast. So the first question I asked was, what is the, mo the worst thing that could happen to you while you were at Camp Green Lake? The answer was you could be bitten by a yellow spotted lizard and you would die a slow and painful death. So that's the worst thing that could happen to you at Camp Green Lake. Um, the next question I had, is Camp Green Lake really a camp? No, it is not. So if it's not, what is it? It's actually a place for bad boys to go when they've done bad things. Instead of going to jail, they send them to this camp to make sure that they turn into good boys and dig a hole and you know, all that stuff. So it's not a camp. It's kind of like a correct, correct, juvenile correction center. So it's not jail, but it's um, a place where they go if they've made some bad choices. Um, number three, I said, who does the family always blame when something goes wrong? Some of you put Stanley. They don't blame Stanley, but they do blame a Stanley. So everybody in Stanley's family, all the men, are named Stanley. So the person that they they blame is the first Stanley, which is his no good, dirty, rotten, pig stealing, great, great, great grandfather. So they always blame the grandfather, okay? Um, and then number four, who robbed K Stanley's great, great grandfather? Her name was Kissin Kate Barlow, okay? She robbed the first Stanley. So the one they always blame, okay? And then number five, who is the person that Stanley meets at Camp um, Green Lake and what does he like to eat? So the first person he meets at Camp Green Lake is Mr. Sir. And Mr. Sir's favorite food right now is sunflower seeds. He eats those sunflower seeds because he gave up smoking and he doesn't want to start again, so he eats the sunflowers instead, okay? So we just left off where Stanley had just gotten to Camp Green Lake and he's about to get into all of what's going to go on, okay? So today we're going to read chapters 5 through 8. I'm excited. Are you? Let's go. Okay. Chapter 5 There were six large gray tents, and each one had a black letter on it. A, B, C, D, E, or F. The first five tents were for the campers. The counselors slept in F. Stanley was assigned to D tent. Mr. Pendansky was his counselor. My name is easy to remember, said Mr. Pandansky as he shook hands with Stanley just outside the tent. Three easy words, pen, dance, key. Mr. Sir returned to the office. Mr. Pandansky was younger than Mr. Sir and not nearly as scary looking. The top of his head was shaved so close it was almost bald, but his face was covered in a thick curly black beard. His nose was badly sunburned. Mr. Sir isn't really so bad, said Mr. Pendansky. He's just been in a bad mood ever since he quit smoking. The person you've got to worry about is the warden. There's really only one rule at Camp Green Lake. Don't upset the warden. Stanley nodded as if he understood. I want you to know, Stanley, that I respect you, Mr. Pendansky said. I understand you've made some bad mistakes in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But everyone makes mistakes. You may have done some bad things, but that does not make you a bad kid. Stanley nodded. It seemed pointless to try and tell his counselor that he was innocent. <coughs> he figured that everyone probably said that. He didn't want Mr. Pen Dance Key to think he had a bad attitude. Excuse me, guys, I have a tickle. Okay. I'm going to help you turn your life around, said Mr. said the counselor, but you're going to have to help too. Can I count on your help? Yes, sir, Stanley said. <coughs> Mr. Pandansky said, good, and patted Stanley on the back. Two boys carrying shovels were coming across the compound. Mr. Pandansky called to them. Rex, Alan, I want you to come and say hello to Stanley. He's the newest member of our team. 
The boys glanced wearily at Stanley. They were dripping with sweat, and their faces were so dirty that it took Stanley a moment to notice that one kid was white and the other was black. What happened bar to Barfbag? asked the black kid. Lewis is still in the hospital, said Mr. Pendansky. He won't be returning. He told the boys to come shake Stanley's hand and introduce themselves like gentlemen. Hi, the white kid grunted. That's Alan, said Mr. Pendansky. <coughs> My name's not Alan, the boy said. It's Squid, and that's X-Ray. Hey, X, said X-Ray. He smiled and shook Stanley's hand. He wore glasses, but they were so dirty that Stanley wondered how he could see out of them. Mr. Pendansky told Alan to go to the rec hall and bring the other boys to meet Stanley. Then he led them inside the tent. There were seven cots, one, each one less than two feet to the next one. So that's not a lot of space. Which was Lewis's cot? Mr. Pendansky asked. Barf, sle barf bag slept here, said X-Ray, kicking at one of the beds. All right, Stanley, that'll be yours, said Mr. Pendansky. Stanley looked at the cot and nodded. He wasn't particularly thrilled about sleeping in the same cot that, as someone who used to be named Barf Bag. Seven crates were stuck in, the, in two piles at one side of the tent. The open end of the crates faced, it, faced outward. Stanley put his backpack, change of clothes, and towel in what used to be Barf's Bag crate. It was at the bottom of the stack that had three in it. Squid returned with four other boys. The first three were introduced by Mr. Pendansky as Jose, Theodore, and Ricky. They called themselves Magnet, Magnet Armpit, and Zigzag. They all had these little nicknames, explained Mr. Pendansky. However, I prefer to use the names their parents gave them, the names that society will recognize them by when they return and become useful and hardworking members of society. It ain't just a nickname, X-Ray told Mr. Pendansky. He tapped the rim of his glasses. I can see it inside you, Mom. You got a big old fat heart. The last boy either didn't have a real name or else he didn't have a nickname. Both Mr. Pendansky and X-Ray called him Zero. You know why they name him Zero? asked Mr. Pendansky. Because there's nothing going on inside his head. He smiled and pay playfully shook Zero's shoulder. Zero said nothing. And that's Mom, said a boy. Mr. Pendancy smiled at him. If it makes you feel better to call me Mom, Theodore, go ahead and call me Mom. He turned to Stanley. If you have any questions, Theodore will help you. You got that, Theodore? I'm dependent on you. Theodore spit a thin line of saliva between his teeth causing some of the other boys to complain about the need to keep their home sanitary. You were all new here once, said Mr. Pendansky, and you all know what it feels like. I'm counting on every one of you to help Stanley. Stanley looked at the ground. Mr. Pendansky left the tent, and soon the other boys began to fill up, file out as well, taking their towels and change of clothes with them. Stanley was relieved to be left alone. But he was so thirsty, he felt as if he would die if he didn't have something to drink soon. Hey, uh, Theodore, he said, going after him. Do you know where I can fill my canteen? Theodore whirled around and grabbed Stanley by the collar. My name is not Theodore. It's Armpit, he said. He threw Stanley to the ground. Stanley stared up at him, terrified. There's a water spigot on the wall on the shower stall. Thanks, armpit, said Stanley. As he watched the boy turn and walk away, he couldn't, for the life of him, figure out why anyone would want to be called armpit. In a way, it made him feel a little better about having to sleep in a cot that had been used by somebody named Barfag. Maybe it was a term of respect. Chapter 6 Stanley took a shower if you could call it that, ate dinner, if you could call it that, and went to bed, if you could call his smelly and scratchy cot a bed. Because of the scarcity of water, each camper was only allowed a four-minute shower. It took Stanley nearly that long to use 
to get used to the cold water. There was no knob for hot water. He kept stepping into it, then jumping back out from the spray until the water shut off automatically. He never managed to use his bar of soap, which was just as well because he wouldn't have time to rinse off the suds. Dinner was some kind of stew meat and vegetables. The meat was brown and the vegetables had once been green. Everything tasted pretty much the same. He ate it all and used his slice of white bread to mop up the juice. Stanley had never been one to leave food on his plate, no matter how it tasted. What'd you do? One of the campers asked him. <clears throat> At first, Stanley didn't know what he meant. They sent you here for a reason. Oh, he realized. I stole a pair of sneakers. The other boys thought it was funny. Stanley wasn't sure why. Maybe because their crimes were a lot worse than stealing shoes. From a store? Or were they on somebody's feet? Asked Squid. Uh, neither, answered Stanley. They belonged to Clyde Livingston. Nobody believed him. Sweet feet, said X-Ray. Yeah, right. No way, said Squid. Now, as Stanley lay on his cot, he thought it was kind of funny in a way. Nobody had believed him when he said he was innocent. Now, when he said, now when he said he stole them, nobody believed him either. Clyde Sweetfeet Livingston was a famous baseball player. He'd led the American League in stolen bases over the last three years. He was also the only player in history to hit, ever hit four triples in one game. Stanley had a poster of him hanging on the wall of his bedroom. He used to have the poster anyway. He didn't know where it was now. It had been taken by the police and was used as evidence of his guilt in the courtroom. Clyde Livingston also came to court. In spite of everything, when Stanley found out that Sweet Feet was going to be there, he actually got excited about the prospect of meeting his hero. Clyde Livingston testified that they were his sneakers and that he had donated them to help raise money for the homeless shelter. He said he couldn't imagine what kind of horrible person would steal from homeless children. That was the worst part for Stanley. His hero thought he was a no-good, dirty, rotten thief. As Stanley tried to turn over on his cot, he was afraid it would collapse under all his weight. He barely fit in it. When he finally managed to roll over on his stomach, the smell was so bad that he had to turn around again and try sleeping on his back. The cot smelled like sour milk. The thought it w Though it was night, the air was still very warm. Armpit was snoring two cots away. Back at school, a bully named Derek Dunny used to torment Stanley. The teachers never took Stanley's complaint seriously because Derek was so much smaller than Stanley. Some teachers even seemed to find it amusing that a little kid like Derek would pick on someone as big as Stanley. On the day Stanley was arrested, Derek had taken Stanley's notebook and long after a long game of come and get it, finally dropped it in the toilet in the boys' restroom. By the time Stanley retrieved it, he had missed the bus and had to walk home. It was while he was walking home carrying his wet notebook with the prospect of having to copy the ruined pages that the sneakers fell from the sky. I was walking home and the sneakers fell from the sky, he told the judge. One hit me on the head. It hurt, too. They hadn't exactly fallen from the sky. He had just walked out from under a freeway overpass when the shoe hit him on the head. Stanley took it as some kind of sign. His father had been trying to figure a way to recycle old sneakers, and suddenly a pair of sneakers fell on top of him, seemingly out of nowhere, like a gift from God. Naturally, he had no way of knowing they belonged to Clyde Livingston. In fact, those shoes were anything but sweet. Whoever had worn them had had a bad case of foot odor. Stanley couldn't help but think that there was something special about the shoes that they would somehow provide the key to his father's invention. It was too much of a coincidence to be a mere accident. Stanley had felt like he was holding Destiny's shoes. He ran. Thinking back now, 
He wasn't sure why he ran. Maybe he was in a hurry to bring the shoes to his father. Or maybe he was trying to run away from his miserable and humiliating day at school. A patrol car pulled alongside him. A policeman asked him why he was running. Then he took the shoes and made a call on his radio. Shortly thereafter, Stanley was arrested. It turned out that the sneakers had been stolen from a display at the homeless shelter. That evening, rich people were going to come to the shelter and pay $100 to eat the food that the poor people ate every day for free. Clyde Livingston, who had once lived at a shelter where he was when he was younger, was going to speak and sign autographs. His shoes would be auctioned, and it was expected that they would sell for over $5,000. All the money would go to the help the homeless. Because of baseball schedules, Stanley's trial was delayed several months. His parents couldn't afford a lawyer. You don't need a lawyer, his mother had said. Just tell the truth. Stanley told the truth, but perhaps it would have been better if he'd lied a little. He could have said that he found the shoes in the street. No one believed they fell from the sky. It wasn't destiny, he realized. It was his no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. The judge called Stanley's crime despicable. The shoes were valued at over $5,000. It was money that would provide food and shelter for the homeless, and you stole that for them, just so you could have a souvenir. The judge says that there was an opening at Camp Green Lake, and he suggested that discipline of the camp might improve Stanley's character. It was either that or go to jail. Stanley's parents asked if they could have some time to think it out, think it, find out more about Camp Green Lake, but the judge advised them to make a quick decision. Vacancies don't last long at Camp Green Lake. Chapter 7 the shovel felt handly, oh, sorry. The shovel felt heavy in Stanley's soft, fleshy hands. He tried to jam it into the earth, but the blade banged against the ground and bounced off whatever without even making a dent. The vibrations ran up the shaft of the shovel and into Stanley's wrist, making his bones rattle. It was still dark. The only light came from the moon and the stars, more stars than Stanley had ever seen before. It seemed he had only just gotten to sleep when Mr. Pendansky came in and woke up everyone. <coughs> Using all his might, he brought the shovel back down into the dry lake bed. The force stung his hands, but made no impression on the earth. He wondered if he had had a defective shovel. He glanced at Zero, about 15 feet away who already scooped out an earth, a shovel full of earth and dumped it on a pile that was already of almost a foot tall. For breakfast, they'd been served some kind of lukewarm cereal. <clears throat> the best part was the orange juice. They each got a paint carton. The cereal actually didn't taste too bad, but it smelled just like it's caught. Then they filled their canteens, got their shovels, and were marched out across the lake. Each group was assigned a different area. The shovels were kept in a shed near the showers. They all looked the same to Stanley, although X-Ray had his own special shovel, which no one else was allowed to use. X-Ray claimed it was shorter than the others, but if it was, it was only by a fraction of an inch. The shovels were five feet long from the tip of the steel blade to the end of the wooden shaft. Stanley's hole would have to be deep as he shoveled, and he'd have to be able to lay the shovel flat across the bottom in any direction. That's why X-Ray wanted the shortest shovel. The lake was so full of holes and mounds that it reminded Stanley of pictures he'd seen of the moon. If you find anything interesting or unusual, Mr. Pendansky had told him, we should report it to either me or Mr. Sir when we come around with the water truck. If the warden likes it, likes what you found, you'll get the rest of the day off. What are we supposed to be looking for? Stanley asked him. You're not looking for anything. You're digging to build character. It's just if you find anything, the warden would like to know about it. He glanced helplessly at his shovel. It wasn't defective. He was defective. 
He noticed a thin crack in the ground. He placed the point of his shovel on top of it, then jumped on the back of the blade with, his, with both feet. The shovel sank a few inches into the patch of earth. He smiled. For once in his life it paid to be overweight. He leaned on the shaft and pried up his first shovel full of dirt, then dumped it to the side. One, ten million, only ten more, I'm sorry, only ten million more to go, he thought, but then placed the shovel back in the crack and jumped on it again. He under several shovelfuls of dirt in this manner before it occurred to him that he was dumping the dirt within the perimeter of his hole. He laid his shovel flat on the ground and marked the edges of his hole where they would be. Five feet was awfully wide. <clears throat> he moved the dirt he'd already dug up out of past his mark. He took a drink from the canteen. Five feet was awfully deep, too. The digging got easier after a while. The ground was hardest at the surface, where the sun had baked a crust about eight inches deep. Beneath that, the earth was looser. By, by the time Stanley broke past the crust, a blister had formed in the middle of his right thumb and it hurt to hold the shovel. Stanley's great-great-grandfather was named Ela Yelnax. He was born in Latibia. When he was 15 years old, he fell in love with Mi Myra Minkle. He didn't know he didn't know he was Stanley's great-great-grandfather. Myra Minkle was 14. She would turn 15 in two months, at which time her father had, de had decided she should be married. 15. That's so young. Ela, or Elia, it's Elia, I'm sorry. Elia went to her father to ask for her hand, but so did Igor Bargoff, the pig farmer. Igor was 57 years old. He had a red nose and fat, puffy cheeks. I will trade my fattest pig for your daughter, Igor offered. And what do you have, Myra's father asked e Elia. A heart full of love, said Elia. I'd rather have a fat pig, said Myra's father. Desperate, Elia went to see Madame Zeroni, an old Egyptian woman who lived on the edge of town. He had become friends with her, though she was quite a bit older than him. She was even older than Igor Bar Barkov. The other boys in his vi village liked to muscle, mud wrestle, liked to mud wrestle. Elia preferred visiting Madame Zeroni and listening to her many stories. Madame Zeroni had dark skin and a very wide mouth. When she looked at you, her eyes seemed to expand and you felt like she was looking right through you. Elia, what's wrong? She asked even before he told her he was upset. She was sitting in a homemade wheelchair. She had no left foot. Her leg stopped at her ankle. I'm in love with Myra Minky, Elia confessed, but Igor Barkov has offered to trade his fattest pig for her. I cannot compete with that. Good, said Madame Zeroni. You're too young to get married. You've got your whole life ahead of you. But I love Myra. Myra's head is, as, Myra's head is as empty as a flower pot. But she's beautiful. So is a flower pot. Can she push a plow? Can she milk a goat? No, she's too delicate. Can she have an intelligent conversation? No, she's full, silly and foolish. Will she take care of you when you're sick? No, she is spoiled and will only do what she wants and will only want you to take care of her. So she's beautiful. So what? Patooey! Madame Zeroni spat on the dirt. She told Elia that he should go to America. Like my son, that's where your future lies, not with Myra Minkle. But Elia would hear none of that. He was 15, and all he could see was Myra's shallow beauty. Madame Zeroni hated to see Elia so forlorn. Against her better judgment, she agreed to help him. It just happens my so gave birth to a litter of a pig yesterday litter a litter of piglets yesterday she said there is only one little runt whom she won't suckle you may have him he would die anyway 
Madame Zeroni led Elia around to the back of her house where she kept her pigs. Elia took the tiny piglet, but she didn't see what good it what good it would do him. It wasn't much bigger than a rat. He'll grow, Madame Zeroni assured him. Do you see that mountain on the edge of the forest? Yes, Elia said. On top of the mountain there is a stream where the water runs uphill. You must carry the piglet every day to the top of the mountain and let it drink from the stream. As it drinks, you sing to him. She taught Elia a special song to sing to him. On the day of Myra's 15th birthday, you should carry the pig up the mountain for the last time. Then take it directly to Myra's father. It will be fatter than any of Igor's piglets. Pigs. If it's that big and fat, asked Elia, how will I be able to carry it up a mountain? The piglet is not too heavy for you now, is it? asked Miss Madame Zeroni. Of course not, Elia said. Do you think it will be too heavy for you tomorrow? No. Every day you will carry the pig up the mountain. It will get a little bigger, but you will get a little bit stronger. After you give the pig to Myra's father, I want you to do, do one more thing for me. Anything, Elia said. I want you to carry me up the mountain. I want to drink from the stream, and I want you to sing the song to me. Elia promised he would. Madame Zeroni warned that if he failed to do this, he and all his descendants would be doomed for all eternity. At that time, Elia thought nothing of the curse. He was just a 15-year-old kid, and eternity didn't seem much longer than a week from Tuesday. Besides, he liked Madame Zeroni and would be glad to carry her up the mountain. He would have done it right then and there, but he wasn't strong enough yet. Stanley was still digging. His hole was about three feet deep, but only in the center. It sloped upwards on the edges. The sun had only just come up over the horizon, but he already could feel its hot rays against his face. As he reached down to pick up his canteen, he felt a sudden rush of dizziness and put his hands on his knees to steady himself. For a moment, he was afraid he would throw up, but the moment passed. He drank the last drops of water from his canteen. He had blisters on every one of his fingers and only in the center of each palm. Everyone else's hole was a lot deeper than his. He couldn't actually see their hole, but could tell by the size that of their dirt piles. He saw a cloud of dust moving across the wasteland and noticed that the other boys had stopped digging and were watching too. The dirt cloud moved closer, and he could see that it trailed behind a red pickup truck. The truck stopped near where they were digging, and the boys lined up behind it. X-ray in front, Zero at the rear. Stanley got into the line behind Zero. <clears throat> Mr. Sir filled each of their canteens from a tank of water in the bed of the truck. <clears throat> As he took Stanley's canteen from him, he said, This isn't the Girl Scouts, is it? Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. Mr. Sir followed Stanley back to his hole to see where he, how he was doing. You better get with it, he said, or else you're going to be digging in the hottest part of the day. He popped some sunflower seeds in his mouth, deftly removed the shells from his teeth, and spat them into Stanley's hole. Every day, Elia carried the little piglet up the mountain, sang to it as it drank from the stream. As the pig grew fatter, Elia grew stronger. On the day of Myra's 15th birthday, Elia's pig weighed over 50 stones. Madame Zeroni had told him to carry the pig up the mountain on the day as well, but Elia didn't want to present himself to Myra smelling like a pig. Instead, he took a bath. It was his second bath in less than a week. Then he led the pig to Myra's. Igor Barkov was there with his pig as well. These are two of the finest pigs I've ever seen, Myra's father declared. He was also impressed with Elia, who seemed to have grown bigger and stronger in the last two months. I used to think you were a good-for-nothing book reader, he said, but now I see you can be an excellent mud wrestler. May I marry your daughter? Elia boldly asked. 
First, I must weigh the pigs. Alas, poor Elia should have carried his pig up the mountain one last time. The two pigs weighed exactly the same. Stanley's blisters had ripped open. The new blisters formed. He kept changing his grip on the shovel to try to avoid the pain. Finally, he removed his cap and held it between the shaft of his shovel and his raw hands. This helped, but digging was harder because the cap would slip and slide. The sun beat down on his unprotected head and neck. Though he tried to convince himself otherwise, he'd been aware for a while that his pile of dirt was too close to his hole. The piles were outside his five-foot circle, but he could see he was going to run out of room. Still, he pretended otherwise and kept adding more dirt to the piles, piles that he would eventually have to move. <clears throat> the problem was that when the dirt was in the ground, it was compact. It expanded when it was excavated. The piles were a lot bigger than his hole was deep. It was either now or later, reluctantly, he climbed up out of his hole and once again dug his shovel into his previously dug dirt. Myra's father got down on his hands and knees and closely examined each pig, tail to snout. Those are two of the finest pigs I've ever seen, he said at last. How am I to decide? I only have one daughter. Why not let Myra decide, suggested Elia. That's preposterous, exclaimed Igor, expelling saliva as he spoke. Myra is just an empty-headed girl, said her father. How can she possibly decide when I, her father, can't? She knows how she feels in her heart, Elia said. Myra's father rubbed his chin. Then he laughed and said, oh, Why not? He slapped Elia on the back. It doesn't matter to me. A pig is a pig. He summoned his daughter. Elia blushed when Myra entered the room. Good afternoon, Myra, he said. She looked at him. You're Elia, right? She asked. Myra, said her father. Elia and Igor have offered each offer a pig for your hand in marriage. It doesn't matter to me. A pig is a pig. So I will let you make the choice. Whom do you wish to marry? Myra looked confused. You want me to decide? That's right, my blossom, said her father. Gee, I don't know, said Myra. Which pig weighs more? They both weigh the same, said her father. Golly, said Myra. I, I, I guess I choose Elia. No, no, Igor. No, 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 Elia. No, Igor. Oh, my, I don't know. I think a number, I will think of a number between one and ten. I will marry whoever guesses the closest number. Okay, I'm ready. Ten, Igor guessed. Elia said nothing. Elia, said Myra. What number do you guess? Elia didn't pick a number. Marry, Igor, he muttered. You can keep my pig as a wedding present. The next time the water truck came, it was dr driven by Mr. Pendansky, who also brought snack sack lunches. Stanley sat with his back against a pile of dirt and ate. He had a bologna sandwich, potato chips, and a large chocolate chip cookie. How you doing? asked Magnet. Not real good, said Stanley. Well, the first hole's the hardest, Magnet said. Stanley took a deep breath. He couldn't afford to do dawdle. He was way behind the others, and the sun just kept getting hotter and hotter. It wasn't even noon yet, but he didn't know if he had the strength to stand up. He thought about quitting. He wondered what they would do to him. What could they do to him? His clothes were soaked with sweat. In school, he had learned that sweating was good for you. It was nature's way of keeping you cool. So why did he feel so hot? Using his shovel for support, he managed to get to his feet. Where are we supposed to go to the bathroom? He asked Magnet. Magnet gestured with his arm to the great expanse around them. Pick any hole. Any hole, sir, he said. Stanley staggered across the lake, almost falling over a dirt pile. Behind him, he heard Magnet say, 
but make sure there's nothing living in it. After leaving Myra's house, Elia wandered aimlessly through the town until he found himself down by the wharf. He sat on the edge of the pier and stared out into the cold black water. He could not understand why Myra had trouble deciding between him and Igor. He thought she loved him. Even if she didn't love him, how couldn't she see how a foul person Igor was? It was like Madame Zeroni had said. Her head was as empty as a flower pot. Some men were gathering on do another dock, and he went to see what was going on. A sign read, Deck Hands Wanted, Free Passage to America. He had no sailing experience, but the ship's captain signed him aboard. The captain could see that Elia was a man of great strength. Nobody ever car could carry a full-grown pig up the side of a mountain. It wasn't until the ship had cleared the harbor and was heading across the Atlantic that he suddenly remembered his promise to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. He felt terrible. He wasn't afraid of the curse. He thought that was a lot of nonsense. He felt bad because he knew Madame Zeroni had wanted to drink from the stream before she died. Zero was the smallest kid in camp in Group D, but he was the first one to finish digging. You finished? Stanley asked enviously. Zero said nothing. Stanley walked to Zero's hole and watched him measure it with his shovel. The top of his hole was, perf was a perfect circle, and the sides were smooth and steep. Not one dirt clot more than necessary had been removed from earth. Zeri Zero pulled himself to the surface. He didn't even smile. He looked back at his perfectly dug hole, spat in it, then turned and headed back to the camp compound. Dude, Zero's one weird dude, said Zigzag. Stanley would have laughed, but he didn't have the strength. Zigzag had to be the weirdest dude Stanley had ever seen. He had a long skinny neck, a big round head with wild fuzzy blonde hair that stuck out in all directions. His head seemed to be bobbing up and down on his neck like it was on a spring. Armpit was the second one to finish digging. He also spat in his hole before heading back to camp compound. One by one, Stanley watched each of the boys spit in his hole and returned to the camp compound. Stanley kept digging. His hole was almost up to his shoulders, although it was hard to tell exactly where the ground level was because of all his dirt piles completely surrounded the hole. The deeper he got, the harder it was to raise the dirt up and out of the hole. Once again, he realized he was going to have to move the piles. His cap was stained with blood from his hands. He felt like he was digging his own grave. In America, Elio learned to speak English. He fell in love with a woman named Sarah Miller. She could push a plow, milk a goat, milk a goat and most importantly, think for herself. She and Elia often stayed up half the night talking and laughing together. Their life was not easy. Elia worked hard, but bad luck seemed to follow him everywhere. He always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He remembered Madame Zeroni telling him that she had a son in America. Elia was forever looking for him. He'd walk up to complete strangers and ask if they knew someone named Zeroni or had ever heard of anyone named Zeroni. No one did. Elia wasn't sure what he did do, what he do, what he do if he'd ever find Madame Zeroni's son anyways. Carry him up a mountain, sing the pig lullaby to him. After his barn was struck by lightning for the third time, he told Sarah about his broken promise to Madame Zeroni. I'm worse than a pig thief, he said. You should leave me and find someone who isn't cursed. I'm not leaving you, said Sarah, but I want you to do one thing for me. Anything, said Elia. She, Sarah smiled. Sing me the pig lullaby. He sang it for her. Her eyes sparkled. That's so pretty. What does it mean? Elia tried his best to translate it from Latvian into English, but it wasn't the same. It rhymes in Latvian, he told her. 
I could tell, said Sarah. A year later, their child was born. Stanley, or Sarah named him Stanley, because she noticed that Stanley was Yelnats spelled backwards. Sarah changed the words of the pig lullaby so they rhymed, and every night she sang it to little Stanley. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was as soft as the skies, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, it cries to the moon, if only, if only. Stanley's hole was as deep as his shovel, but not quite wide enough on the bottom. He grimaced as he slit, sliced off a chunk of dirt, then raised it and flung it into a pile. He laid his shovel back down at the bottom of the hole, and to his surprise, it fit. He rotated it, rotated it and only had to chip off a few chunks of dirt here and there before it would lie flat across his hole in every direction. He heard the water truck approaching and felt a strange sense of pride at being able to show Mr. Sir and Mr. Pendansky that he had dug his first hole. <coughs> he put his hands on the rim and tried to pull himself up. He couldn't do it. His arms were too weak to lift his heavy body. He used his legs to help, but he just didn't have any strength. He was trapped in his hole. It was almost funny but he wasn't in the mood to laugh. Stanley, he heard Mr. Pendansky call. Using his shovel, he dug two footholes in the whole wall, wall, whole wall. He climbed up to see Mr. Pendansky walking over to him. I was afraid you fainted, Mr. Pendansky said. You wouldn't have been the first. I'm finished, Stanley said, putting his blood spattered cap back on his head. All right, said Mr. Pendansky, raising his hand for a high five but Stanley ignored it. He didn't have the strength. Mr. Pendansky lowered his hand and looked down at Stanley's hole. Well done, he said. You want to ride back? Stanley shook his head. I'll walk. Mr. Pendansky climbed back into the truck without filling Stanley's canteen. Stanley waited for him to drive away, then took another look at his hole. He knew it was nothing to be proud of, but he felt proud nonetheless. He sucked up the last bit of saliva he had and spat. All right, so when we come back, we're going to be ready for chapter eight. I know this was a little bit long, so hang in there, but it's going to get really good. So now you need to go back in your email, answer the questions that I have from this section, okay? Chapters five through seven is what we read today, okay? And we'll start with eight next Monday. All right, guys, have a great time. Miss you.